the pastor's preaching, he's a special father, so. Um, there will be no evening service uh, on Sunday, that Sunday night, Jan, uh, June 18th, so just remember that. We're going to allow you to have time to spend with your fathers that evening, so Sunday morning service only June 18th. Don't forget it. Amen. Why don't we all stand? This time we want to receive. We never take, take anything. We receive it, right? It is your offering to the Lord, so it's yours to give, and we will receive it and, and invest it back into the kingdom and the growth and the revival that's taking place here in Katy. If you would, why don't you just lift it before the Lord and let's go to him in prayer and ask him to bless it as we receive it tonight. Lord, we thank you again for another opportunity to be in your house. I never want to take that for granted, Jesus, because there are many places in this world where it's not allowed for people to gather together. So thank you for that freedom today. And Lord, we thank you for the ability to give for the many blessings that you've poured into us Tonight we give in return, Jesus, believing that our offering and our tithe will go towards the furtherance of your kingdom. So we give it with a glad heart and with thankfulness tonight. Everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. Would you bring your tithe and offering to the Lord this evening? How many of you are thankful to know that God always works all things together for your good? He's never failed once and he won't stop with you. You saw the end from the beginning, the mountains and valleys that I would walk through, and you saw my victory before I faced my enemies, and you said Destroy me, and they are all working together for my. 
Is there anybody who's learned they can trust the Lord? Oh, come on, church. Aren't you glad you can trust him? Hallelujah. I cried and he came. I cried and he answered. You can depend on Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. You can make your way back to your seats on your way. Make sure you say hello to somebody you haven't spoken to yet. Tell them you're glad to see them. Amen. We are so very excited that each of you are here with us this evening, a special fellowship service. Uh, we don't always dress this way, but just so you know, you come, if you're a first-time guest or it's your first time to be here, you've come on a great day. We've got tacos, crawfish, petting zoo, all of that after service. But right now, we're here to magnify and worship the Lord. I'm here with a special announcement. Um, coming up, one thing that Brother Hodge didn't mention, and it wasn't in his notes, uh, next Sunday, is we honor all of our graduates. So high school, college graduates, we're honoring them next Sunday night. However, this Sunday night, we're honoring a special graduate, and we've got a video that we want to play for you. Are you ready, audio team? All right, here we go. Congratulations, Pastor, on earning your doctorate degree. We all love you. We're proud of you. And so very thankful to have you as our pastor at the Pentecostals of Katy. God bless you today. Hey, Dr. Pastor, just wanted to tell you how proud I am of you. This is such an amazing accomplishment. Thank you for all that you do for us, always pushing us to never stop learning, to continue growing and setting the bar high in that area. Love you. So glad you're out of school. So glad you got this behind you now. Congratulations. Thank you, Pastor McKee, for being a fantastic example in the way of spiritual matters and in your pursuit of excellence. Congratulations on your doctrine. Congratulations, Pastor. Just wanted to say that we're all so very proud of you and all that you've accomplished. Um, I can only imagine that the road at times to get here has not been easy. I'm sure there's been long hours put in. And so uh, considering not only the time and effort that, that you ha had to give towards your studies, but also as the senior pastor here at the POK, um, what an accomplishment. And we just wanted to say that we are so very proud of you and wish you congratulations. I also wanted to say thank you from the bottom of our heart, from the hearts of the Hodge family, and I'm sure many, many of the members of POK would join in and just say thank you for your leadership and uh, also want to just personally thank you for your friendship over all of these years. Our family goes back, hard to believe, almost 17 years now, and um, you've just been such an inspiration uh, to my life and to my family's life, and I just wanted to say thank you. There's, you know, there were a number of years where we thought somewhere else may have had something better for us, but quickly learned that POK has been and always will be our home so we couldn't be any happier to be back here in texas serving in ministry at the pok under yours and your wife's leadership and just so thankful to be a part of the pentecostals of katie again thank you for being a, a pastor and a preacher who was always willing to stand up and preach truth from behind the pulpit and tell the congregation what we need to hear what thus saith the lord and i i know that we all feel your passion and your heart every time you get up and preach and we just thank you for doing everything that you can do to help help us all get to heaven congratulations dr rob mckee hey there pastor just wanted to wish my congratulations to you on graduating with your doctorate thank you for being an awesome pastor always being supportive and helping me on my way in my furthered education you're the best 
Dr. McKee, I love it. So excited. Congratulations on the journey that you've been on and you've actually completed now your doctorate. What a great achievement. Congratulations. Wish I could be there to celebrate tonight. I will be there next Sunday night and I'll watch you walk down the aisle in your robe. That will be really cool. God bless you, Dr. McKee. I don't know what to do with this, man. All these doctors in the house. I don't even know, man, it's just crazy. I, every time someone says, doctor, doctor, I turn around and it's not me now, it's you. God bless, man, love you guys. We have a special guest. Yeah, that's great. Give it all up for Pastor. I'd like you to help me welcome a dear friend, the district superintendent of the South Texas District of the United Pentecostal Church. Uh, Brother David Foss is here, our superintendent. Brother Foss, come and greet this congregation. You can be seated. God bless you. I, I am here tonight to honor this precious man of God who has made such a great accomplishment. And... <clears throat> I don't have that many friends that are doctors. So I'm, I'm just gonna tell you, you're in a handful of people that I call friend that also has their doctorate, amen. So I appreciate this man, his leadership. He is a powerful man of God, as you know, I'm sure. But from my vantage point, to allow, for God to allow me to walk alongside men of God, like this precious man, uh, I, I'm very humbled by it. And, uh, you know, Brother McKee is the kind of man from my standpoint that I could spend days with and never get tired of uh, talking to him and having him impart the things that he has in his heart. He is a man of vision. He is a man of tremendous... Uh, intelligence about the work of God. He is a man who has dedicated his life to the work right here in Katy, Texas. And it shows. It's a very powerful thing to see a man who, ex who is excellent in everything that they do. And I appreciate the opportunity. My wife and I, when I had the opportunity to come and be part of this celebration tonight, we wouldn't have missed it for anything. And we are so happy to be here to celebrate with this great man of God. Amen. I told him recently, I said, you know what? Uh, your leadership needs to touch more people. And I believe that God has great and big plans, not only for the POK, but I believe that God is gonna use Dr. McKee in a very powerful and profound way in this last day revival that I believe is coming to the world. Amen. God bless you. I love you, Brother McKee. Thank you, Brother Foss. And without further ado, Brother Bracken, Brother Hodge. There it is, folks. Certificate certification by the faculty that the requisite program of studies has been completed and by action of the Board of Trustees, the degree of Doctor of Ministry in Church Revitalization is conferred upon Robert Lester McKee. Man, you may be seated. Thank you so much. What, a, what an honor it is, first of all, to have several of our guests. I looked out there. I didn't, I didn't know they were going to be here. I walked in and saw Brother Falls, and I said, is there a pastoral election going on that I didn't know about? Maybe. But uh, and then I looked over and saw my mom and my sister and, and uh, Aunt Gail, Uncle Eddie, and, and 
and uh, I knew something's up. So, um, but thank you so much for your kindness towards me, and uh, I love I love this church, and I've I've preached at a lot of churches in the last 30, 33 years has it been? Yeah, thirty three years. And uh, man, I'm ready to be crucified now. So, uh, but it's been 33 years and uh, of, of ministry, 10 years of evangelizing, and, and of course, 23 years here pastoring. And I've, I've had the opportunity to preach in a lot of great churches and a lot of great pulpits for great men of God across the fellowship. But there's no place that I would rather minister, no place I'd rather attend church than right here at the POK. I love this church. And, and I have said it before, it, and you're repeating it almost uh, to the point of ad nauseum, but I just, uh, if, if you ever get tired of me being pastor, um, you know, and you kick me out of this position, I'm going to go across the street and throw rocks at you when you come to church. No, I'm, I'm still going to come here because I love this church, and I couldn't imagine being a part of any other congregation, and I love you all dearly. And uh, thank you. Thank you for this honor. Thank you, Brother Foss, Sister Foss, for being uh, here tonight. And uh, God is good. I also want to take just a moment, in case I don't get the opportunity later, and say how much I appreciate the patience of my wife and my daughters. Uh, and it does take patience because you're only given so many hours of the day. And when you're spending four or five hours a day writing, sitting at a computer, uh, reading, uh, it, it, that, that those hours have to come from somewhere. And sometimes they have been taken from, from my family and even from some of the responsibilities of the church and this amazing church staff has helped me. This is not a one man uh, sacrifice. A lot of people have sacrificed to allow me to be able to do, uh, do that. I'm so glad it's over though. So glad, so glad that it's over. I, I've said it many times, but I don't plan on reading a book for at least two years. And um, I don't want to read anything ever again. So please don't hand me any books. No, I'm kidding. I, uh, I've, I've got a list of books that I want to read. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to reading a fictional book of some kind eventually. But uh, it is such an honor. Also, I want to give honor to my mom, who uh, is part of the reason why I made this sacrifice. She is an example of a life learner. There's nobody like my mom. I'm telling you, I've never met anybody like her. She is adventurous, independent. She doesn't, she could, one minute I call her, she's in Branson, and the next minute she's in Florida. I mean, she just is always going somewhere. I remember the days we thought, if she ever retires, we're gonna get a full-time babysitter. And no, she's on the road. And, uh, but she has also dedicated her life to education, has probably three or four times as many college credit hours as I do just because she just loves going back to school ever and, uh, and she just will take a class just something that interested her and she'd go back to school but I I want to honor her today and I wish of course my father could be here and uh, and but God is good I could talk for a while but I better stop we have a great preacher lined up for tonight and uh, God is good Amen. Thank you so much for your kindness. I'm looking forward to our fellowship after service. But uh, amen. That's all I can think of. Somebody come get the mic. Amen. Good. Amen. The two grace, greatest fellowships you can have on earth is fellowship with the Lord. Somebody said amen. And fellowship with your brother and your sister. Amen. And so tonight is Fellowship Service 2023 at POK. Who's excited to be a fellowship service tonight? Praise God. Hallelujah. And I'm so glad that we have all these wonderful guests here today. But you know what? First and foremost, I'm glad that Jesus Christ shows up. Every time we come together, two or three, the Lord Jesus shows up in our midst. And didn't we hear one more fantastic message this morning? Can we give Pastor McKee another hand for that wonderful message? I want to thank each and every one of you for being with us here at the POK this evening. 
And of course, we've got online guests that are watching around the world. Can we give all of our online guests a hand of appreciation for tuning in? God bless you. Now, if this is your first or second time, first or second time here at the POK, and you have not yet filled out a guest card, or you have not filled out an iPad with your personal information, would you just raise your hand this evening? First or second time guest, and you have not filled out a card, we want to give you uh, some gifts. or some gifts associated with filling out a card. As Pastor always mentioned, even if you don't like the singing or the preaching, you might as well get the free stuff. Amen. And so if you'll fill that out, we've got a special gift for you right after service in the cafe. Amen. Got a few names here we're going to read. Who's going to help me welcome all of our guests tonight? Praise God. First of all, as we've already mentioned, we've got uh, Reverend David Foss and Sister Kathy Foss, our district superintendent. Thank you all for being with us. God bless you so much. We have pastor's mom and sister I got to meet the other day. God bless you. So good to see you. And I think uh, Sister Hammer might have some kin folks over there. God bless sister and brother-in-law. Amen. God bless you. Amen. We've got uh, Tristan Franklin. Where are you this evening, Tristan? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. We've got Starlea. Chiapetta, Starlia, did I say that right? Where are you this evening? Amen. Praise God. Thank you. God bless you. I hope I didn't butcher that. All right. Uh, we have uh, Ernesto, Esther, and uh, Abriel. Did I say that right? These are first-time guests. Ah, there you are. Thank you all for being with us here at the Pentecostals tonight. God bless you. Amen. We have a few second-time guests. Bree, Israel, Khalil, and Cordier. Amen. Where are y'all this evening? On the left. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Okay, we have some special guests. Uh, Shane Dillard, Peyton, and Landon. Where are y'all? Amen. All right. Anybody seeing any hands? Oh, they're being shy. <laughs> we found you. Be sure your sins will find you out. Monsi Arena. I, don't, I may be saying that wrong. Mons or Monsi Arena? Where are you this evening? Ah, I'm sorry if I messed it up. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, why don't we stand? We're going to put five minutes on the clock. We just ask you to shake some hands and meet some new friends, and we'll see you back in five minutes. God bless you.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Make your way back to this. If we let you guys just continue on, this would go on for 15 or 20 minutes. So it's five minutes. The clock's been run out for almost a minute now. So make your way back to your seats, if you will. Amen. Pastor, if you're nearby, if you want to introduce our speaker. Amen. But we are so very excited. Each of you are with us this evening. We love and appreciate you. Thank you for being here. I know that some of you have your own home church, so we're glad you're visiting with us tonight. Amen. But one more time, let's welcome Pastor Dr. Robert Lester McKee. You don't know how much I appreciate them throwing in that Lester in the middle of it. Thank you, Mom. I appreciate that. Amen. Well, God is good. Amen. I love what I feel here. You know, <clears throat> I've, I've, uh, I've said that we are in the wedding season. Uh, we've already had a couple of weddings already, and we have, I think, another six or seven before the end of the year. And uh, we, got, we got babies being born, and uh, we got all kinds, not us personally, but uh, amen. But uh, we, we have... Uh, we got a lot of, of new things happening, and it's just exciting to be a part of it. Um, but I, I love to connect with the church. We got to have so many new families. Thank God for what happened in our service this morning. Amen. Great, great service. Five baptized, and I believe three received the gift of the Holy Ghost. So thankful for that. Amen. It's been a wonderful Pentecost Sunday. And... Uh, I didn't know it when I asked him, but uh, I have asked Brother George and Pedigo, my future son-in-law, to come and preach the word tonight, and uh, I know that he's going to be a blessing. Why don't we all stand together? We're going to move on just so we can get to our fellowship, our time of fellowship together. Please don't leave early. We've got a lot of great food. Somebody's got to eat those crawfish, mud bugs, sea roaches, whatever you call them. And uh, no, I shouldn't have said that probably. Of course, there's a lot of things I probably shouldn't say, but that I do anyway. Uh, but please uh, stick around. We also have tacos. Uh, and so it's going to be a really, a lot of great food, a lot of great uh, fun and fellowship. And uh, But I, right now it's time for the word of the Lord. Amen. Put your hands together and let's welcome Brother George and Pedigo. Praise the Lord, everybody. Man, praise the Lord. Thank you, Dr. McKee, uh, for the opportunity to speak tonight. Congratulations from me as well. Uh, I know we're workshopping the name of things. Someone told me to call you Dr. Dad, and I haven't gotten full approval for it yet, but we're still workshopping the name. It's been an interesting process. Uh, but it is so good to be with you all tonight. I love you all. Thank you for your kindness towards me. I know I have a very important mission tonight, and that's to... Uh, bring the word of God. I also have a secondary mission. It is to make sure all of us get to go eat crawfish. And uh, you guys are in luck because I love crawfish. So trust me, as much as you are ready to eat them, I am ready to eat them. But how many are ready to hear the word of the Lord? Amen. Amen. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews 4, 1 through 2, we'll get started. Hebrews 4, 1 through 2. In Jesus name. Thank you to all the worship leaders for leading us in worship tonight. Thank you for everyone who's helping us getting ready for fellowship day. Hebrews 4, 1 through 2. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Not being mixed with the faith in them that had heard it. The author of Hebrews here is referring to a segment of the Jewish community who were still living under the old law of the Old Testament, the Mosaic law, which they had to make physical sacrifices for the repentance of their sins. Whereas Jesus was the propitiation for our sins and died and rose again that we may have new life in him. That was the gospel that was preached was that his Holy Ghost would come after he had risen, after they were baptized in his name. They'd be filled with his spirit. He was the comforter. Yet there were people who did not believe his authority as God. And so they rejected the gospel because they did not allow the word preached to mix with their faith. And just for a few minutes, if I could preach to you just for a few minutes, is called Jesus Christ, 
Collector's Edition. Jesus Christ, Collector's Edition. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. God touches tonight. Let us hear your word. Let it change us. Open our hearts to what you would have us to receive. We love you and we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I begin to read this passage of scripture and it began to interest me how the gospel affects people in different ways. We see that in Matthew as Jesus uses the parables of the seed sows. Uh, the seeds of the gospel are sown on thorny ground, on hard ground, on good ground, and the roots take place in people's lives in a different ways. And some people come to the truth of what God tries to tell them, and some people do not. And it is their reaction or the conditions under which they let those seeds grow to fruition. And I remember I was talking, uh, uh, thinking about this verse, and it struck me. I had a memory. Remember, my dad, he's a preacher, and he was the assistant pastor of the church I grew up in, and he would preach out from time to time, but whenever my dad would preach out and I had to stay at home, me and my sister, we had to stay home, he would always come back, and after he would get back home, he'd come in the door from the garage, we'd hug him, and we would say, Dad, we missed you, and he knew it was coming. About 30 seconds after we said, Dad, we missed you so much, we'd say, what'd you buy me? You got me a prize, right? Don't play around with me, Dad. I know there's like... 15 gift shops coming out of the airport. Like, I know you bought me something. And, and every time I would ask my dad, yes, he would open up his carry-on suitcase and he would bring out whatever he had bought me from his adventures abroad. And I was so excited to see what it was. And this one specific time, I was a car guy. I love to collect Hot Wheel matchbox cars. Do I have any collectors of Hot Wheels matchbox cars in the room? That's right. I know some of y'all just race cars on the iPad or the iPhone, but some of us had like the little orange magnetic tracks that we set up in our room and we, I had all of them, had a whole drawer full and all of these. So he brought me back this car and it was a beautiful old Chevy and I was so excited when I opened it, it was a beautiful black, uh, matte black Chevy and I was gonna open it up out of the package. My dad said, no son, hold on before you open that. He said, I wanna let you know you can open it and I'm, I'm a kid, I'm ready to play with my car, I'm ready to play with my toy. And he said, well, hold on, son. He said, I want you to read the package. And I said, I looked at it, and I said, what? It's a collector's edition. It was a collector's edition Chevy. And I said, well, Dad, it's a car. I want to play with it. And he said, yeah, I understand that, son. He said, but it, that's a collector's edition. He said, you can open the package, and you can interact with it right now. Or you could wait a little bit, and it will be more valuable down the road. Now, I was young, but I was trying to understood. Uh, the, 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 the process of delayed gratification I said, okay, fine, Dad, I'm gonna trust you. If you said it's more valuable later, I'm not gonna play with it right now. So I took that toy car in the cellophane package and I put it on my bookshelf in my room and year after year, I would clean my room and I'd clean my room and I'd go back and I'd look and said, not yet. But one day that car is gonna be worth everything to me. The next year, not yet, but that car is gonna be worth everything to me. And then one day I, I come home from school and uh, my room was magically clean again. I don't know how it happened, but sometimes I would just leave with my bed unmade, my socks all over the floor, and I'd come home, and it was magically clean. Thank God for mothers, right? My mom was a saint, and uh, I, I began to look through my room, and I noticed I looked up at the shelf to point at my car, my Chevy, and it wasn't there. And I walked downstairs, and I began to question everyone in the house. Macy, did you take my Chevy, my sister, and she said, no, I don't, I don't like cars. I said, mom, dad, did you take my Chevy? And my mom said, what are you talking about? I said, well, uh, I had a car that I was, had on the bookshelf. It was a collector's edition. It was supposed to be worth so much about 10 or 15 years from now. And, uh, it, it's, it, and she said, oh, buddy, I'm so sorry. I went through your room. We're getting ready for a garage sale. And I said, okay, so let's go get it. And she goes, no, 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 I understand. I, I, I just put a 50 cent sticker on it and I sold it in the garage sale. This car that I had been waiting years and years and years to collect the value on, I thought was gonna bring me, make me a millionaire. This matte black Chevy was gonna make me a millionaire. I was gonna be rich. It was gonna be great. And my mom sold it for 50 cents in the garage sale. And now I had nothing, but I began to realize those years and years and years of me keeping it on the shelf, I was in the presence of that Chevy. I got to walk in and look at it every day. And yet I never understood what it felt like to feel those little plastic reels roll across the countertop. I never truly got to understand just how fast it could ride the handrail down the stairs. I never got to test any theories or do any stunts with my, my, my black Chevy because I had left it. It was a collector's edition that I had left on the shelf. I never interacted with it. I never played with it. I never, it never taught me what it could do. And I lost it. I lost the value there. I never mixed my life with the Chevy. It was kind of interesting. I know I'm telling a lot of stories, and I promise I'll make a point here in a second. 
But uh, I, I, I was at, I'm an artist, and I went to the Penrod Art Fair. It was a big deal in Indianapolis. And I was walking around looking at the different painters, and they would set up their booths and their stuff that they would sell their painters from. And I found this one guy loved his artwork, and I walked in, and I saw this one painting in the corner. And unbeknownst to me, it was a painting of a painting. In the painting, there was a shelf, and there was, it was a child's shelf in his room. And there was a little can of, uh, uh, like, rubber bands and a bouncy ball and all that stuff. But in the middle, there was a painting by numbers that was unfinished, and it was a painting of Jesus at the Last Supper that someone was teaching themselves paint by numbers. And it was only halfway finished. And I thought it was just so interesting. I said, well, sure, this has got to have a story behind it. I asked him, I said, hey, what, what's the deal with this painting? He said, oh, yeah. He said, well, when I was learning to paint when I was a young man, he said, I would use paint by numbers, and I would paint famous paintings by paint by numbers. He said, I don't know why I was going through my old stuff, I was pouring stuff out of the attic, and I found this old painting by numbers I had started of Jesus at the Last Supper, and he goes, I don't really know. Maybe halfway through, I just lost interest, or I got busy, or did something, and so I, I, just, I just put it up on the shelf, and I, I just forgot about it, and I got convicted right there in the moment because I said, I wonder how many times... I've looked at God in his eyes. I've understood everything that he could do for me. I could understand everything he'd sacrifice for me. And yet I never took him off the shelf. Whether I just lost interest or whether I just got busy at some point or another in my life, there were moments when I would be struggling and I'd be scared and I'd be afraid of things in my life and I realized, why am I feeling this way? And yet there was a God sitting on the shelf saying, Georgian, if you could just pick up the package and open it, I could show you everything I would want to do in your life. Everything. But I had to mix grace. I had to mix the gospel. I had to mix the truth of scripture with something deep inside of me. I had to be mixed with faith before God could do me any good. I had to say, Jesus, I need you here. I need you in my life. It won't do me any good unless I choose to talk to you. It won't do me any good unless I choose to read your word. It won't do me any good until I pray. But I would leave him on the shelf. Uh, it's interesting. I begin to research. I, I'm a, kind of a collector. I amass junk. I'm going through the house right now, and I told Savannah, I, I, she's my fiance, and, and uh, bless God, I, thank you. I'm so excited. But uh, I was looking, I was looking through all the boxes in the house the other day, and she's starting to send packages of things up to the house that she's wanting to move in. And I told her, I said, well, you're going to have to go through some of these boxes to tell me what I'm allowed to keep. And which is the 95% that I have to throw away. And I, because I'm kind of a pack rat, I, I, I get sentimental over things. And I want to know what makes a collectible valuable. Apparently, the two qualifying factors for something to be considered a collectible is that it has to be one, rare, and then it has to be two, in good condition. So if you were to apply that to a comic book, a pair of clothing, a pair of shoes, a, a, a magazine, a com a, 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 an action figure, something that was old, it was produced a long time ago, what it has to be considered to be rare and collectible is that it was A, a limited series. It was only so many of them made. It's rare. They're no longer in production. They don't make them like they used to. And two, they've got to be in good condition. If you were special now, did I have any action figure collectors in the room? Come on, I'm looking for the guys who were co collecting the action figures. You had the G.I. Joes. You had them all. You, uh, somebody had them. I know I did and had them in the house. It was always cool. There was always that one character who was also a limited edition, and that was the character that was battle damaged. It wasn't the pristine general who came out in his, his fatigues. It was the one who had a couple bullet holes in his hat, and he had the scuff marks on his boots because it had proved that that action figure had, had been through something, and it helped my imagination. He had been through war. He'd seen some stuff, and... I just like to remind everybody that when it, it comes to God, why do we not want to interact with him sometimes? If my, my one thing is to keep him on the shelf. Now, I went out today. I was looking. Believe it or not, they really do make Jesus action figures. You wouldn't believe it, but they do. They're on eBay. Uh, I guess that's an appropriate place to sell those. But I, I didn't find one today, so I went out and I bought an action figure. Uh, this is not Jesus. This is Obi-Wan Kenobi. But at a distance, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's not far off. Uh, it's not bad, you know. Uh, but I, I understand that this is sometimes how I, I look at God, right? Now, I, I'd like for you to just imagine with me. Pretend that you could look at the attributes of Jesus like you were reading the box on an action figure, a collector's edition. This is Jesus Christ, the collector's edition. 
Now, for something to be considered collectible, it has to be number one, it's rare. That means there can't be a whole lot of other things out there like it. So can I just remind somebody tonight, if you were struggling on whether it's worth it to invest in a relationship with God, there's no one else like him. He's God and he's God alone. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Come on, Buddha's not going to do it. Muhammad's not going to do it. A thousand other gods aren't going to do it. There's one and there's one alone. That makes him the rarest commodity in the universe. He's the only one who can forgive my sins. He's the only one who can redeem a broken soul. He's the only one who can heal a broken body. He's the only one who can bring me joy. The only one who brings peace. There's only one God that can step out on nothing and breathe out words that make stars and galaxies and worlds and seas and oceans and creatures. He's rare. There's only one of him. And so he needs to be part of my life because I can't find him anywhere else. You can try. You can make something else a collectible. You can try to find something else that will match up to me. Can I tell you? It'll always fall short. There's always going to be some fake in the reproduction. There's always going to be a knockoff in the reproduction. Someone's going to make something that might have a form of godliness but lack the power thereof. But can I tell you? When push comes to shove, I call the name of Jesus. When the going gets rough, I call the name of Jesus. Come on. An imitation is not going to get it done. A knockoff is not going to get it done. When I'm in trouble, I want God. Because he's rare. And there's no one else like him. Can I tell you the greatest thing about God is he's in good condition. Every time you take him out of the box and you interact with him, guess what? His grace is new every morning, which means every time that I mess up because I'm a flawed human being, I can look back and I can say, Jesus, I, I, I got to come back to your throne of grace. I'm going to boldly approach it because you said if I would repent, you would forgive. God, I, I messed up, but I'm sorry. And he said, guess what? My grace is new every morning. Come on. He hasn't stopped healing. He hasn't stopped forgiving. He hasn't stopped working miracles. He hasn't stopped baptizing people in his name. He hasn't stopped filling them with the Holy Ghost. He has not stopped turning financial situations around. He has not stopped healing cancer. He has not stopped healing broken hearts. The best thing about Jesus is when you take him out of the package, he's still in good condition. Now someone's going to come and they're going to tell you that your, your faith is old. It's, it's a tradition. It's something that was only alive thousands of years ago. But I'm telling you, five people going down in the name of Jesus and three being filled with the Holy Ghost sounds pretty in good condition to me. He's still moving. He's still proving just how great he is. He's in good condition. You can't wear him out. Every time you take him out of the box and you begin to interact with him, it doesn't lessen his value. He only gets more and more valuable. The more I know him, the more I want to seek him. The more I see his face, the more I want to say, Jesus, do something else. God, show me your glory. I want to see something else. He's valuable. He's rare and he's in good condition. And can I tell you, we're the luckiest beings in the universe you know why because we are even blessed to have the battle damaged version of Christ sitting on the shelf because there was a never another God who came down to earth and wrapped himself in mortal flesh just to bleed for me Look, I know this is simple. I know this is not going to blow anyone's mind, but can I tell you, there's not another solution. There's not a businessman. There's, there's not a company. Uh, there's not a conglomerate out there that's going to fix your problem. There was only one God who said, I've got the answer to it all. And he came down and he, he was battle damaged. He, he had nowhere to sleep. He was homeless. He had nowhere to live. He allowed them to put a crown of thorns on his head, to take the flesh off his back, to put the nails in his hand and in his feet. He's... He's rare, he's in good condition, and he was even battle damaged. By his stripes we are healed. He took sin upon that cross with him, and he died for the things that I couldn't pay for. He's rare, in good condition, and even battle damaged, making him a part of a limited series of one. No other God's done that for anybody. And yet, sometimes I'll read the package, and I see, wow, he comes with all the cool features. He casts out the demons. He heals the sick. 
he, he turns water into wine. Look at that. I didn't even know this model could do that. And, and yet I read all the cool things about him and I get busy. And I lose interest. And, and there's something cool or flashy that gets in the way. I get scared and I put him back on the shelf. Now it's enough for me to be in the room with him. He's on my shelf, right? I'm in his presence. I, I'm around him. I know he can see me. I know he's living here with me. I, I'll say, now Jesus, come on into my heart and, and, and I, I'm yours, right? And then he's saying, no, don't you understand? That's, that's just not quite enough. You've got to invite me. You've got to take me out of the box. It's not enough to have me behind this little cellophane window. I can see you, but don't you understand how much I want to touch your heart? Don't you understand how much I want to touch your life? Don't you understand what I want to do for you? And yet, I'm just content to be in his presence and catch his eye every once in a while. But I don't want to take him out of the package and interact with him. And I promise I'm coming to a close here pretty soon. There's two reasons we get scared to interact with Jesus Christ. There's two reasons we're scared to take him out of the package. And number one is we're afraid that if we give everything to God, that we lose things. If I open the package and I start to interact with Jesus, I lose my will. I lose my control over my life. And that means because it's impossible to come interact, to, to come into an interaction with an almighty God and not change. Can I tell you that? You don't get to come face to face with God Almighty and be neutral. You have to make a choice. Either you choose a relationship or you do not. There's no in between, hot or cold. He spews you out of your mouth. There is no neutral with God. You make a choice when you come face to face with your creator. You either say, that's what I want or that's not what I want. So we're afraid that if we come face to face with Almighty God, then we lose control over what we want. I lose, our, I lose my will. I, I lose all the things that I've built, my job, my career, my family, the, my popularity, my friend circle, I've, my influence, all of that goes away. And sometimes we like the lifestyle. We know, okay, it doesn't match up word for word with what his word says, but it's what I'm used to. It's what I've always done. It's how I've always lived. And yet every time I come into interaction with that God, his word convicts me and it asks me to change things that I don't know if I want to change. You see, he said in Luke 9, 24, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever loses his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? But can I remind you, God never takes more than he gives. I'm a living testimony. I've had a lot, of, and I'm, I'm young, I get it. I, I know there's people who've lived quite a much more life than I have, and you've had a lot more taken away, but I've seen things taken away from me. I, I've had things in my life that have all of a sudden disappeared, but can I tell you, there's not one thing that God's taken out of my life, and he's saying, son, if you'll stay faithful in just a few years, I'm gonna bring it back around. If you'll stay faithful, and God says, hey, I need a little bit more time. I need you to let go of those things. I need you to throw those things away. Because guess what? On the other end of it, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you comfort. I'm going to give you joy. Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. God is a better giver than I am. So when God asks for us for something, I'm willing to take him out of the package because I know that whatever he asks me for, A, it's because it's for my good, right? Uh, thank you for what you said, Savannah, when you said it's like having the faith like a child, meaning if he's my heavenly father, he just wants the best for his child. So if he takes something away from me, that means he was either dangerous for me or I wasn't mature enough to handle it and I needed a few more years to develop. So can I tell you, if God asks you for something, say, okay, God, I trust you and I'm gonna take you out of the package and I'll interact with you. Because either it's dangerous for me or you're teaching me how to handle the prosperity and the promise of the future. Number two, we avoid contact with God because it reminds us of our own value. You see, when I take God out of the box and I interact with him and I look at how good he is, how awesome he is, how big he is, and the concept of him is just so massive and how... I've, I've messed up so many times and yet he still loves me. He's perfect. He's never messed up once. He's always done everything the right way. And when I begin to look at that, I begin to look at myself and I, I just don't measure up. You see, when I see how big God is, I start to realize just how small and insignificant I am. So I'd rather put him on the shelf far away where we look relatively the same size than get close enough to him to see how big he really is. 
I don't want to take him out of the package. It reminds me of how scared I am in his presence. Isaiah 6 and 5 said, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I've said it before, I'll say it again. When we come in contact with God Almighty, there's only two choices. <laughs> and it brings us face to face with our Creator, and we all of a sudden begin to realize how insignificant I am. God, I can't do anything in fact, I've made too many mistakes. I'm too broken. Don't you see the scars that I have? Don't you see? And you, you took all those from me, but I, I, I chose these scars. These are the things that I, these, these sins, these mistakes, these people I've hurt, my past, my shame, my guilt. God, I could never interact with you because every time I interact with you, it hurts me. It reminds me of how insignificant and how much I've failed and how much I'm flawed. And yet, there's a God that says, Don't you know that for whom I love it, I chasten it and scourges every son? Yet you endure chastening. God deal with you as sons. For what son whom the Father chaseth not? It means he's just, it's just like we're his kid and he's correcting us, saying, No, don't you understand? I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to show you that what you're doing is ultimately going to cause the very death of your soul. So when I convince you, I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm not trying to beat you over the head. I'm trying to warn you that if you keep touching it, it's going to kill you. You keep eating it, it's going to kill you. You keep watching it, it's going to kill you. He's saying, But I love you. There was another son who was scared to be in the presence of his father. And I'm about to close if music wants to come. We see in Luke 15, <clears throat> the story of the prodigal son. He asked his father for his inheritance before it was time and he ran out and he reveled and he pardoned. He spent all of his money and wasted it and he gave everything away. And finally he finds himself broke with no friends, no influence. He's living in a pig pen, sharing the food with the pigs. And he gets so fed up with this situation that he begins to walk towards home and make a plan. He's saying, when I get home, I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to go to my father and maybe, I, I know I've messed up and I'm not really worthy to be in his presence. I don't know if I could interact with him like a father. I don't know if I could interact with him like I'm his son. But I, if I go home and just be a servant, I could be in his presence. I could be around him. I could benefit from the things that he's got around him. And I just don't know if I can act like his son anymore. I just don't know if I can act like I'm his anymore. But can I tell you, when he got close enough to the shelf to touch that package, that father was waiting on the porch. And he said, there is my son. And says the father ran to him and he put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And both of those were the significant signs of a free man. He said, you're not going to be a servant in my household. You're going to be my son. <laughs> I know you messed up but I love you. And when I correct you, it's not because I don't love you. It's because I love you so much that I don't want you to hurt yourself. If we can all stand, I'm gonna end with this. 1 John 4, 16 through 19. And we have known and believed the love of God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out all fear. Can I tell you, when we just will take God out of the box, we finally grasp the understanding of just how much he loves us. When you can put your finger in the scars on his hands and on his feet and you understand what that blood really was supposed to do for your life, all of a sudden that overwhelming love and that overwhelming trust will take over you saying, God, whatever you need from me, I'm going to interact with you because I understand that you love me so much. I love you because you first loved me. Can I tell you, there's somebody here, you've been waiting altar call after altar call to interact with God, and yet every time you get close enough to him, you get intimidated by how big he is and how small you are. And you're just scared. You, you want to be in his presence. It's nice to feel the goosebumps every once in a while and find the peace in the altar. But we're just not ready to take him out of the package. Some of us are afraid of how our lives are going to change. Maybe you're a visitor. You, you've, you've come into contact with Jesus in a mild form. You just don't know everything about him yet. And you want to know more, but you're scared of how that's going to change your life. Can I tell you? There is a loving father. He's waiting on that shelf. He's rare. There's no one else like him. 
He's in good condition. His power is ready and available to you to meet every need you have. And if you're worried about how messed up your life has been, guess what? He's battle damaged and his blood is still being poured out to cover every mistake you've made. So I'm wondering, is there anybody willing to step down to this altar and say, God, tonight's the night. I'm gonna open up that package and I'm gonna take you out of the box. I've had trying to solve all the issues on my own. I've tried to do it on myself. I I can't. But there's a place in an altar where you can say, God, whatever it looks like, whatever it feels like, I'm gonna open up that package. I wanna know what it feels like to be in your presence, God. I wanna know what it feels like to have your hand touch my life. I wanna know what healing feels like, God. I wanna know what true peace feels like. I've tried it on my own and it doesn't work. God, I'm taking this box off. I wanna see what you can do. You can come at this moment. These altars are open. Ministers are here to pray with you for each and every need. I'm challenging you. If you've come into God, if you've come into contact with God in mild ways, there's a God waiting to hear your cry. He's able and he's willing. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. He's still moving, he's still proving just how great he is, how great he is. He's still moving, he's still proving just how great he is, how great he is. He's still
to reach out and begin to pray for somebody next to you right now. Find another brother, another sister. Come on, let God move, work through you right now. Minister to somebody. How great you are. How great you are. Oh, how great you are. How great you are. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. There is no one high, no one great, no one Christ our Savior, great and glorious. There is no one higher, no one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able. Christ our Savior, great and glorious. There is no one higher, no one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able. Christ our Savior, great. Our God is so great. Our God is so good. Amen. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Amen. It was at the very beginning of the 14th century, around 1317, 1320 or so, that history's greatest, or actually wealthiest leader uh, ruled over portion of Africa. He, his name was Mali Malan, and he was <clears throat> he was an incredibly uh, wealthy man, and uh, also known as, as perhaps you've heard of the story Mansa. Uh, I believe Mansa, Mansa was his his his, uh, his name. So Mansa Musa was uh, was incredibly wealthy. He had made literally billions of dollars in the ivory trade and the gold trade but how he received his fame was his his journey to mecca and in his journey along the way history said that he carried 
uh, millions of tons of gold and distribute it to all of the, the cities and all of the communities and villages that he passed through so that every city that he entered when he left, he entered a village of paupers, but he left a, a village of millionaires. Amen. And that's the way I feel about the presence of God. I was nothing without him. But the moment he stepped into my life, amen, he brought value with him. Amen. And if you're here today and God is not a part of your life, I want you to know all you got to do is let him in. And he'll, he'll take all your brokenness and he'll make changes in your life. Amen. We have one to be baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. Jordan, I now baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Thank God for what he's doing. If you've never been baptized in water in the name of Jesus, perhaps you were baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I want to challenge you, encourage you to get rebaptized. But this time, in the, this time in the name of the Lord Jesus, you've never received the Holy Ghost. You can have it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Pettigo, for that word today. And uh, amen. I'm, I'm taking Jesus off the shelf, taking him out of the box. Hallelujah. That's all right. Come on, let God touch you right now. Lift your hands to the Lord. Let's thank God for what he's doing. He's making a change. God's filling somebody with the Holy Ghost for the first time, renewing somebody in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Serve a great God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. To all of our guests that are with us tonight, thank you so much for being here on this very, it's an unusual, but a very special service. Uh, these fellowship services are different than our traditional Sunday night, but we have service every Sunday night at 6 p.m. We encourage you to be back with us, and um, as well as Sunday mornings. 8 a.m. and another service at 10 a.m. Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. and then another service again at 7.30. So lots of options. And so I encourage you to be back here with us. Amen. We have, uh, we have some food that we're going to receive here in a moment. I'm looking around for somebody that knows about it. And uh, Brother, uh, oh, I think they're all out getting it ready. So amen. We'll just, uh, yes, sir. Okay, so here, here's the deal. We have crawfish, a crawfish plate, and we have a taco plate. And the cost of them are $8 a piece. I promise you, you're not going to get this quality of food anywhere else for that price. And so uh, <clears throat> great, tremendous food. And if you want some of both, just buy two plates. Amen. Just get two plates. That's the way you make it work. But... Uh, I, I know that uh, you're going to enjoy the food. I encourage you. To all the POK members, please take a moment and, and let's connect with all of our guests that are here today. Again, it's, a, it's such an honor to have some of our interns, our summer interns here with us. But let's pray before we're dismissed. Let's pray and ask God to bless our food and our fellowship together. Father, we thank you for this word that we heard tonight. Thank you for all of our special guests that are here. I pray that you would... To bless our time of fellowship. I pray that you would bless our food. We thank you for it. God, we are so blessed and we thank you for your blessings. Bless this time today. Bind us together in unity through this fellowship. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. There are bounce houses, I believe, uh, petting zoo or something, all of that outside of the gym, on the far side of the gym. So for all the kids, please don't miss those.